welcome, welcome to our panel and welcome to uh, each of our viewers here today. Um, thank you for joining us. This is the fourth in our series of uh, AmCham Sri Lanka Knowledge Hub webinars. Um, as you've seen, we've had some uh, interesting topics and interesting conversations uh, running along the line. And today is the fourth edition. Um, and we're totally, I'm sorry, the third edition rather. You know, there, there's just too much going on. So today's the third edition. I do apologize. Uh, the third edition of our AmCham Knowledge Hub webinar series. Um, and I welcome all of you warmly to uh, the series. Uh, today, the topic that we'll be talking about is uh, cybersecurity, cyber vulnerability, and uh, digital hygiene, hygiene, something that's really important, I think, in today's context, uh, where our entire lives and livelihoods as business leaders, as, um, as, as you know, citizens of Sri Lanka, as uh, children, mothers, fathers, you know, uh, the gamut of what we are as human beings. Our entire lives and livelihoods have moved online in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we find that even in the last week, uh, I think a lot of schools have gone online with uh, online classes. So even our children's lives are now online. Uh, so it's an interesting topic as well as a very timely and important topic for us to understand how vulnerable we are uh, as a people, how vulnerable we are as a nation as well, because their implications are not really, not only uh, based on what sort of access we're giving to our personal lives and what sort of access we're giving to our organizations. Uh, it is also a question of how much we're opening up our country, our nation, uh, our economy, and uh, you know, our very lives and livelihoods uh, when it comes to uh, living our lives online. Uh, so it'll be, uh, an, it, it is an important and uh, enticing topic. It will also be an interesting subject for us to see what our panelists have to say in terms of this today. Um, as you know, our question and, our question, uh, our question and answer little tab is open there and you can start sending us your questions. Uh, our moderator will take a look at them. He'll, uh, uh, he will uh, bunch them together and ask the questions of our panelists. Uh, as we reminded you, even in our last few sessions, uh, don't fret if we're unable to get to you in terms of time. Uh, our panelists will uh, very kindly take a look at your questions even after the webinar is over. And uh, having gone through them, they will uh, post their answers to you. Uh, one of the conversations that we had, uh, you know, in, in the prior, in the pre-session, uh, was that uh, all our panelists are very high on their uh, tech and cyber knowledge. But there are those of us outside of that tech and knowledge industry uh, who from a lay perspective, from a general perspective, don't really understand the technological uh, technological lingo and the technological ideas of it. But we do need to stay safe as well. So as the panel continue, uh, goes on with their conversation and as Sujit moderates the panel, uh, I will also occasionally throw in a question or two from a lay perspective. Uh, and please feel free uh, to, to uh, share your questions and comments in terms of a lay perspective as well. No question is to... Uh, you know, it's too, it is wrong, no question is too stupid, no question is too uh, unacceptable. Please go ahead and ask whatever questions you have to ask. Uh, so without uh, rambling on, as I seem to be doing, uh, let me just introduce you to your panel today and then I will hand over to your moderator. Uh, so we have starting off uh, our panel, we have Mr. Lal Dias, who's the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Sri Lanka CERT, uh, the Computer Emergency Readiness Team, I believe is what it uh, stands for. Uh, Lal was instrumental in setting up Sri Lanka CERT and presently serves at its, as its chief executive officer. Uh, he's an active member of FIRST, the Forum for Accident Response and Security Team. Uh, he is also, uh, and also of uh, APSERT, the Asia Pacific Regional CERT. Uh, he's a trusted contributor to the Asia Pacific and global cybersecurity uh, community and forums. Lal is a recipient of the Asia Pacific Information Security Leadership Award in 2014, in fact. Uh, he's a chartered information technology professional. I'm sorry, I'm reading off because these, as I said, I'm not a tech techie. So I actually have to read off to make sure that I uh, don't get your accolades wrong. Um, <clears throat> so he's a chartered information technolo technology professional and a fellow of the British Computer Society. And prior to setting up Sri Lanka CERT, uh, he worked for more than 25 years in the banking industry. So he has great insights uh, when it comes to the challenges uh, facing uh, businesses and individuals in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, next on our panel, Mr. Lanthan Nirutan, our security and political analyst. And no, he will not be analyzing any politics for us today. It's all about security. 
Um, Nilan is a visiting lecturer at the Defense Services College of Sri Lanka and a fellow of the Bandar Naika Center for International Studies. Uh, he's a highly respected uh, academic in the fields of international relations, human rights, and in international security. Uh, so we'll actually be picking his brain today in terms of uh, cyber terrorism and uh, what sort of implications there are on a national level for us when the, you know, when we open up uh, the networks and they're opening up online working in terms of all, uh, you know, even in terms of banks, in terms of uh, the, the national security apparatus and in terms of all kinds of state sectors. So we'll be talking, uh, we'll be picking Nilan's brain on that aspect of his. Uh, Sonari Dandania. Sonari is Senior Manager of uh, Information Security at Commercial Bank PLC. Uh, she's a member of ISACA and a Certified Information Security Manager and Certified in Risk and Information Systems Control. Sonari is also an IRCA Certified Information Security Management System Lead Auditor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Sonari counts 15 years of experience in the domain of information technology, focusing on the areas of information security, audit, and uh, risk management, and has the singular honor of having been at the helm of commercial banks success successful um, uh, certification under the rigorous ISO 27001 information security standards. Uh, Rahal Jaiwadhana is the head of Technology Alliances and Innovation for Millennium ITSP. He is our next panelist. Rahal, hi. Uh, Rahal is uh, responsible for technology advancement, strategic partnerships, R&D, and innovation management, and heads the information security business of Millennium IT and has done uh, for over a decade. Rahal describes himself as an entrepreneur creating insights for growth and change. Last but not least, and believe me, this one is a lot. It's a mouthful because that's how qualified our moderator is for today. Uh, Mr. Sujit Christie. Sujit is a passionate cybersecurity um, adoption evangelist and a director with Layer 7 Seguro Consultoria Private Limited. He currently serves as the chief information security officer in several organizations and is a board member of the Isaka Sri Lanka chapter. Sujit is a certified information system security professional, certified information systems auditor, and, a certify, and is certified in risk information system control, a certified IT disaster recovery professional, and holds a diploma in cyber law as well. Uh, Sujit counts over 20 years of experience in this field and is a regular uh, invited speaker at cybersecurity related engagements. Uh, he is a founding member, the Charter Secretary, and past president of the ISC Squared Chennai chapter and was also instrumental in the formation of the ISC Squared Sri Lanka chapter. Um, he is also a recipient of the 2013 ISC Squared Presidents Award, in fact, the first person in uh, the uh, South Asian region to have, uh, South region rather, to have uh, won that award, and an honorary in information security practitioner category for information security leadership achievements. Um, and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, that's your panel, and um, I'm fairly certain that you can't get a better qualified panel for this conversation today. So uh, without, again, rambling on, as I am wont to do, uh, Sujit, let me hand over to you uh, to kick off uh, what is sure to be a very interesting uh, and insightful session for us today. Thank you, Virai. Uh, hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to this, uh, today's discussion on vulnerabilities. Is the risk high or is it very low? Right? We've been grappling with the COVID-19 and I think we've kind of passed that stage. Now we are in a new normal. So this situation has prompted and champ to champion the discussion on the cybersecurity. And I think this is the first industry event which is being hosted in Sri Lanka. And I'm very happy to be hosting, moderating this session. And I'm also very proud to have a very experienced panel. And I was just mentally doing a math to to calculate the many experience collectively, and I think we together we count over 100 years of many experience in terms of whatever we've done in our spheres, and that's that's a lot of experience that the panel carries today. So one of the issues we've been struggling tackling in the last couple of years is to get the private public sector to working together, very especially from a cybersecurity perspective. We always been saying cyber attacks can be very fatal. But we all know if it did happen, it can be as far reaching like what it has been with COVID-19. 
but we are lucky that it has never happened. And all of us know, if it does happen, what the impact could be, right? So, and we've been always very positive. We've been living in hope. And I think several organizations have, have started their journey in cybersecurity in terms of addressing various risks. So no one can actually say nobody has started, but they are in different stages of maturity. But today, when we look back, and very especially, we are at a juncture where we need to look forward, what are we going to do today? What will we do going forward from here? Because we have to reimagine ourselves. And, and I think that's the tagline Rahal's company carries, reimagine, right? So, so we'll probably hear a lot how we can actually reimagine going forward. So one of the areas that has been laid bare by confronting this pandemic that each of you listening today, I know I have encountered this in my life. That is getting my job done. Right? And, and I was telling before the panel started, and we are seeing each other probably after almost about 35, 40 days which otherwise we bump into each other every other day, if not at least a week, right? So today we have to rely on communication platforms, digital platforms, right from getting simple supplies to our homes to schooling our children. And we are talking about including digital medicine and various aspects. So everything is going to go digital. And as we have today, right, we have been very creative in addressing every single opportunity which has challenged us. When, when, when we went into the lockdown, and it appeared to us probably the doom day has dawned. But today we can always proudly look back as Sri Lankans that we have overcome those challenges. We have made things happen. We have bypassed or overcome the challenges. Right? So, the, the challenge which I want to actually discuss and the, the, the panel will discuss today is how do we collaborate, uh, especially from a private sector to public sector, and what is the government doing and how is the government going to address the cyber threats? And we're also going to be talking with respect to the challenges which is posed by the cyber terrorism. And then of course, the challenges and the, uh, the, uh, the the challenges which are faced by the organization, the corporate environment, and also not forgetting the citizens as a whole and the customers, right? So operational collaboration is going to be one of the things which we are going to be talking a lot today, right? So we will discuss about vulnerabilities. We will also discuss about the challenges. We will not talk about anything hypothetical, right? And I don't think the, channel, the panel is here to talk about mm -hmm. hypothesis. We are going to talk about facts. We are talking about, going to talk about reality. We are going to be talking about how we will face this challenge going forward. So with that, I would like to invite Lal uh, to talk about how uh, the Sri Lankan government uh, has uh, taken the initiative to draw up the cybersecurity roadmap for Sri Lanka and the challenges faced. Over to you, Lal. Okay, uh, thank you, Sujit. Um, that was a good introduction. Um, what I would like to do is um, to get the, the whole day, the whole thing kick-started is to tell you uh, whether Sri Lanka is actually ready uh, for the vulnerabilities um, uh, of, the, of the challenge of, of, of uh, cybersecurity. So I'm going to talk about uh, Sri Lanka's cybersecurity readiness and the way forward. Um, uh, in, in a few slides. Uh, Rai, can I have those slides? And then I can quickly go through uh, those slides. Thank you. So, yeah, get to the next slide, please. Right, you talk about um, computer readiness of this country. I mean, you, you talk about computer ownership. Roughly, we have about 24% of our population um, who owns computers. Um, the urban population is much greater. 40% of our population actually owns computers. Um, 
And if you talk about uh, devices and internet usage, they're reasonably high. They're not, they're not, they're not high, they're not high, but they're not low either. Um, if you talk about smartphones, there's nearly 60% of our population um, use smartphones. Um, and in terms of computer literacy, it's almost 30%. So technically, Sri Lanka is, uh, is vulnerable to, to cyber attacks. Next slide, please. Right. Um, I, the next slide is about um, the incidents reported uh, to Sri Lanka CERT. Um, don't see it, right? Right, can you, can you put me on the next? It's, uh, it's up, uh, Lal. I don't know if you're not seeing it as... Uh, uh, I'm, as seeing, I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing slide number two, but I need to see slide number three. No? Right, let me just... Uh, uh, I'll ramble on. Um, yes, we'll, we'll try to <laughs> fix that. Uh, while, you, while you find it. Um, we find that the incidents, number of incidents reported to Sri Lanka CERT um, has grown quite, quite uh, dramatically in the last few years. Um, in fact, it was like something like 250 in, in 2017. It's gone up, it's double that um, in, uh, in 2019. Um, but that's only, um, that is without the social media incidents. I'm talking about uh, regular incidents from the corporate sector and from the government. Um, and that also is, uh, is without the, the incidents that are reported to other agencies, such as the Police Cybercrime Division and the TRC and so on and so forth. Um, and social media incidents have also seen a dramatic increase. It's gone from, um, from a near a thousand or so. Oh, that's good. That was a previous slide. Um, thank you, Rai. Go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, social media incidents, as you can see there, in 2017, we had uh, 3,600 uh, incidents reported, but that again was only to incidents reported to Sri Lanka CERT. Um, there are incidents reported to other agencies. We are in the process of consolidating all that, and probably in another few months, we should be able to share uh, uh, the reports that are, for example, um, the National Child Protection Agency uh, gets thousands of uh, uh, of reports, uh, incidents reported to them, and so does uh, TRC and the Police Cybercrime Division. And the LK Domain Registry has uh, another, uh, another, um, or shall I say, uh, incident reporting arm uh, called Hitavati, and they they get mainly uh, reports uh, from women, young women, and old women alike, um, and that's quite substantial too. Um, so, yeah, so the number of incidents is quite, quite uh, significant. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. And if you look at uh, the cybersecurity landscape in general, um, where um, the global cybersecurity index, cybersecurity index has displaced Sri Lanka, uh, on the legal side, we are still maturing. Uh, they have they've actually have only three ladders, initiating, maturing, and leading. So... Uh, we are in the maturing stage in the, on the legal side, the technical side, the capacity building side, um, and the organizational side. Uh, in some area, one of the areas that we need, we need to focus on is on the organizational side, uh, based on the existing, existence of institutions. Right now, Sri Lanka CERT is the be all and end all of uh, cybersecurity for, for government uh, 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 right now, and that's not good enough. But the institutional framework has to be widened and we are working towards that. Next slides. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, in terms of evolution, Sri Lanka CERT is, is uh, over 13 years old. It's been around for a while. Um, it's a nonprofit organization. Primary function is incident handling, although we do a lot more than that right now. Um, and uh, more importantly, we are, Sri Lanka CERT is a member of, a full member of the Asia Pacific CERT and the Forum for Incident Response and Security Teams. In fact, by um, Sri Lanka CERT is a steering committee member of Asia Pacific CERT, and we were scheduled to host the annual conference and the uh, the AGM uh, of the Asia Pacific CERT this uh, this September. 
but I can't see that happening. We had a call this morning. We had a program committee meeting this morning. Um, and uh, we are still hopeful that the COVID-19 situation will improve and we can host it. Um, we will, we were expecting to have something like a 400 um, participants uh, at the Shangri-La Hotel, but I can't see that happening, to be honest, uh, because of travel restrictions of many countries. But in the worst case, we, it'll have to be um, postponed. Um, and in the, in the very worst case, it'll have to be just a um, virtual meeting uh, of the Asia Pacific community. Um, so yeah, so COVID-19 is affecting all of us. So that's something that we got to live with. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, in terms of evolution of cybersecurity, uh, Sri Lanka CERT was instrumental in establishing the cybercrime division at the CID. Uh, that's, pro that's progressed pretty well. Uh, it was established about five or six years ago, uh, primarily to prosecute cybersecurity incidents under the Computer Crimes Act. Uh, it has a very, very sophisticated digital forensics lab laboratory and they're, they're extremely well trained. The original training was done by Sri Lanka CERT, but subsequently through Korean government funding, uh, the Computer Crimes Division has, has uh, expanded its activities and they're doing extremely well. We also have uh, FinC CERT, which is the financial sector CERT, uh, which was established uh, again another five or six years ago uh, to share threat intelligence anonymously between banks and financial institutions. Um, it, is, uh, it, is, it, is, it is run by a steering committee headed by the central bank and it's in very good hands um, and it's doing a great job as well. Next slide. Um, we have several legislations in place, Computer Crimes Act of uh, number 24 of 2007, uh, which is uh, brought into operation in 2008. Uh, the scope of, of the applicability, applicability is very broad in that, in that act, and it's, it's covered a broad range of offenses that are uh, prosecuted uh, uh, by the law enforcement agencies. Next one, please. Uh, we also have a high level IS, uh, information security policy based on ISO 27001. Uh, where there are 17 domains covering most uh, of the areas in information security. Um, um, and it is used currently by most uh, government organizations, but we are having um, issues in terms of uh, applicability and uh, relevance to some of the smaller organizations. So we are in the process of revamping this and having different levels of uh, information security uh, achievements and security policy achievements. Um, and we, that's part of our a uh, next wave of uh, implementations. Uh, Sri Lanka CERT is also a member of the Budapest Cybercrime Convention, um, uh, and we became a signatory uh, in, uh, in 2015, um, and we acceded to the Cybercrime Convention, Convention exactly on the 29th of May, 2015. Uh, we were the first country in South Asia and the second in Asia after Japan to, to uh, accede to this convention. Uh, we have gone a long way with that. Um, in fact, one of our uh, Sri Lanka Search board members, Mr. Jan Fernando, is, uh, is on the uh, Cybercrime Convention uh, Bureau Committee uh, in, uh, in France, and uh, he's actively involved in driving this in this, our part of the region. Um, right, I come to the most important part of, our, of, of my presentation because in, in, in October 2018, Sri Lanka CERT uh, um, formulated an, a cybersecurity strategy, a national cybersecurity strategy, which was approved uh, in parliament in October 2018. And uh, we, we uh, came up with a plan uh, to implement the provisions under this strategy uh, over a five year period commencing 2019. Um, and we've gone nearly one year. Uh, we've done a fair amount of work uh, there are six trust areas, establishment of uh, government governance framework, legislations, policies and standards, resilient digital government and infrastructure, competent workforce, awareness and empowerment of citizens, public, private, local and international partnerships. Uh, those are the six uh, trust areas. You can download this, uh, this uh, uh, at, uh, from our website here. Um, you should be able to get to our website and download that and it's available online and it's a public, it's in the public domain. Um, next slide. And I've 
Yeah, I'm, I'm ex I can explain this strategy in, 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 in brief terms. Uh, it, it would probably take a, a full hour to explain the whole uh, elements of the strategy, but let me briefly go through some of that. Uh, establishment of a governance framework. Um, as I said before, uh, the governance framework for cybersecurity in Sri Lanka is, is limited. Sri Lanka's cert is the be all and end all of, of cybersecurity in Sri Lanka at the moment, and that's not good enough. Uh, so we're in the process of of, of uh, enacting a piece of legislation. Uh, the legislation was ready and because of the uh, constitutional issues, it hasn't gone to parliament for approval. Computer, it's called the Computer Security, Cyber Security Act. Um, and it, it, it'll, obviously, it'll obviously gone through par, um, the, the cabinet of ministers and it's approved, but it has to go through uh, parliament to get approved. Once that is done, we will have a high level computer uh, cyber security agency in place that will that will drive cybersecurity in Sri Lanka. Uh, we need to also, uh, the second uh, trust area, the enactment of establishment of legislation and policies and standards. Um, that's that again, we, will, we are in the process of reviewing all our legislations. Um, as some of you know, the Data Protection Act is in its draft stage and it has also gone through cabinet and awaiting parliament uh, to reconvene, you know, to have it approved. Um, once that's done, our privacy laws and our data protection laws will be in place, which is a uh, is something that a lot of us are waiting for, and particularly the banks um, for, their, uh, for their KPIs and so on and so forth. Um, um, and so I think it's, uh, it's important to have that in place. Resilient uh, digital government infrastructure. Uh, we need to work with the public authorities to ensure that digital government systems uh, uh, are implemented um, and operate, uh, have, have, have a high level of security, uh, uh, cyber security and resilience. Um, Development of a competent workforce, and that's important too. And I think there's a, there's a lot to do on that front. Um, I'm sure uh, Sujit will agree uh, because IIC Squared has been involved quite a lot. Uh, so has Rahal and everybody else uh, trying, trying to, uh, to build capacity in Sri Lanka uh, on, for cybersecurity professionals. We have a lot of IT professionals, but we don't have enough cybersecurity professionals. So that's something that we're working, working uh, on. Uh, we need to work with the private sector for that. We're also working with the uh, Vocational Training Institute uh, to, to actually uh, offer short-term courses uh, to and identify bright students who can come in and, and, and get certified. Um, raising awareness and empowerment of citizens. Again, that's something that we're working on. We are, we are building a website called Get Safe Online uh, together with some European assistance and that's working well too. Uh, and development of public and private local partnerships uh, that's going on too very well, um, and it's something that we are focusing on in terms of building international relationships. Next slide, please. So finally, the way forward. Um, so we have a four-year action plan uh, ahead of us. Uh, we need to work with key stakeholders in government and private sectors to implement the provisions, uh, uh, provisions of, of the strategy. Uh, we're going to engage with overseas funding sources. We've already done that. We have a, a substantial uh, funding arrangement with the European Union under their Cyber for Dev program. Uh, Sri Lanka Cert is one of the seven or eight beneficiaries. Um, in fact, they've uh, done a fair amount of work in the last 12 months, and they have a, a, some big plans for Sri Lanka in the, in the, in the years to come. Uh, so we're working with a number of funding agencies who will supplement government allocated funding because as you know government allocated funding is always uh, a challenge in difficult times like COVID-19 so I think that will be a, a great help. Um, we need to enact and establish the required legislation policies and standards and that's on the way as I said before. Uh, create a regulatory environment to protect individuals and organizations in cyberspace um, and establish governance framework. Uh, as I said before uh, the government self under the provisions of the Cybersecurity Act. Um, so setting up the cybersecurity agency, setting up a national cybersecurity operations center, which is again, currently uh, on the way. Uh, it's, it's taken a bit of a hit because of the, uh, it, of the pandemic situation here. Um, and we've already established the National Certification Authority that fortunately beat the pandemic and we, we launched it um, in March uh, this year. So the so, so National Certification Authority is in place. Um, and uh, so the root certificate uh, of Sri Lanka is in place too. So I think we will see, uh, it will be, it is currently being used by government now to sign um, 
to sign um, uh, to for, for digital signing of, of documents, uh, which is a great thing. So I think uh, we we we've achieved quite a bit by having it launched just before the pandemic started. Well, that's it, Sujit. So you can take over from there. Thank you, Lal, for the great introduction. And, and it was a great opportunity to tell all our viewers, listeners, the achievements which uh, we all have achieved in the, in the last three, four years. And very importantly, in times like this, the opportunity to sign the documents digital. Right? And we are all used to signing the documents in the manual form. Now, if not for the National Certification Authority, we would be still missing on that, right? So I, I think uh, you all deserve the credit. And I think uh, for all those people who are listening in, we do have a National Certification Authority. You all can get your digital signatures, right? Alternatively, a lot of organizations have been using the DocuSign, but now we do have our own national signatory, signature. Right. So with that, I just want to move on. Lal, I have a lot of questions for you. So when I come back, I will post those questions to you. So Milan, uh, I would like to bring you on and I would like you to you know, give a perspective of uh, what do we see in terms of the cyber warfare? We, we keep hearing this word, right? And, and if we go back in history, Sri Lanka has been geographically in a place where we've been invaded, all right? We've been always uh, been caught in between, right? I mean, so many years of uh, foreign forces occupying the land. And today, uh, you know, we have the freedom. Uh, we have our own resources. But from a digital perspective, where do we draw the line? And what are the challenges we have? So if you can just give a perspective of that, uh, it'll be great. Over to you. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Firstly, so I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Uh, I usually like very generous introductions, but that introduction is a bit too generous. I'm by no means uh, sort of someone who dabbles in the technical side of it. I'm sure there are many people uh, on our panel and in the audience who know a lot more of the jargon uh, than I do. The question that you touched on, I mean, if I could just connect it to uh, uh, Mr. Lal's presentation earlier of how ready we are institutionally, I think ties in directly uh, as the answer to your question. So in terms of cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, what I foresee in the future is that as economies and lives become more digitized, the digital world per se becomes a far more attractive place for insurgent group, for disruptive non-state actors. I mean, uh, one of the sort of uh, really interesting data points in the previous presentation was that even in urban Sri Lanka, less than half of us uh, sort of are digitized, so to speak. And when we go into the rural sites, it's a lot less. So if you look at some countries like, let's say, South Korea, where the sort of uh, where it's more in the 90s in terms of how many people are plugged into the Internet and how many people have access to a computer, those economies are or have organically come to a point where they are, I would say, digital economies. And therefore, there's a lot of ground up innovation and thinking that goes along with it. Whereas my worry is that countries like Sri Lanka, because we will now have to become more of a digital economy, more of a digital culture country, so to speak, in order to deal with this current crisis. Uh, I'm not too sure whether we will have the sort of the ground up expertise and resources to deal with the challenges that come with that. And cyber terrorism, to me, would clearly be one of those things. Now, if we, if we take something like cyber terrorism, India is a constant victim of cyber terrorism. China is a constant victim of it. Really, any, any major country in this region is a victim of both cyber warfare and cyber terrorism. It just so happens that these things don't get reported. But there are hundreds of attacks on India's private and public sector every day online. There are hundreds of uh, uh, cyber attacks on China's private and public sector every day, sometimes from each other. You could say the same for the, for the Americans and the Chinese as well. So we are really in the middle of a world war, if you think about it. It's just that this is an invisible war 
which is not reported and which uh, most of us are aware of, which most of us are unaware of because uh, we aren't really given enough information to sort of panic about it. But the world in general is a world where cyber warfare and cyber terrorism uh, will sort of kick into high gear now. Now, uh, as our economies start, as I was saying, becoming more computerized, this will rise. Now, if I can give, just give you an example. After 9-11, if you, re if you remember, there were a number of terrorist attacks on post offices in the United States with uh, envelopes uh, supposedly uh, containing anti-fax and, uh, and things like that. Now, recently, that was Al-Qaeda. Now, recently, when uh, the Islamic State, when a few insurgents were interviewed about it a couple of years ago, and they said, hey, why don't you, you know, try to attack the post offices in the United States? They said, look, uh, not enough people go to the post office uh, in the United States anymore because uh, most of them send emails, the packages are sent to other sort of service providers. So uh, we, our attacks need to be where they will have a grave impact on the economy of the country. I mean, from a strategic perspective, uh, if you were an insurgent group, you would want to attack an economy and a country where the country is most vulnerable. Right now, we do not see mass attacks, terrorist attacks, or from rival states, uh, however you want to phrase it, on our digital space, so to speak, because our economy doesn't really depend on it. So I suppose it's a it's sort of flip side of what Mr. Lal said in his previous interview, where, yes, we are behind the curve in terms of uh, uh, digitizing the way that we do things, but because we are so primitive, we are also protected in an ironic sense from cyber terrorist attacks because our cyber infrastructure is simply not uh, an attractive enough target. If I was a, if I was a terrorist mastermind or, a, or the leader of a terrorist group, it would still be a lot more attractive to me in Sri Lanka to attack physical targets because those physical targets will still come with a psychological cost and a financial cost that can cripple my enemy, the enemy being the state, uh, let's say Sri Lanka in this case. But once we start becoming more of a digital economy, that's when we will start seeing insurgent groups, non-state actors who want to play a disruptive role. We will start seeing them attack us. And one of the sort of, uh, 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 I suppose, unintended consequences of us coping with the pandemic and of us rising to the challenge of this pandemic and uh, going through more sort of uh, online platforms and digital platforms and things like that is that we will now become a right target. I'm not too sure if, if, if we will still become a right enough target for us to be a constant uh, sort of uh, recipient of terrorist attacks, but we will certainly become a much, our, our cyber assets and our cyber security in general, in my judgment, will become a much more right uh, sort of bullseye for the uh, uh, for the terrorist hit. In terms of cyber warfare, uh, I would say right now, thankfully, we do not have enemies on a state level or even on a non-state level uh, to to the extent where we have to be worried about the constant attacks. So, for example, even though our relationship with uh, certain of our with certain neighbors of us might not be the best it could be. It's not like India and Pakistan, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, India and China, occasionally China and Pakistan, where there are hackers from these countries who are constantly attacking each other, constantly having a go at each other, precisely because of the geopolitical rivalries that are in place there. So right now, because we are too small to be a geopolitical rival, I don't see us becoming the victim of cyber warfare. I don't see us becoming embroiled in a large uh, sort of uh, web of cyber warfare. But our economies will have to change as well. Our country's diplomacy and our, our politics in general will have to change as we come out of this pandemic. Uh, uh, we will eventually have to side with China or India or the United States in terms of someone facilitating uh, sort of economic resurrection. And once that happens, we will also be opening up a Pandora's box of uh, cyber warfare because uh, if we side with China, there will be Indian hackers and American hackers targeting us. If we side with the Americans, there will be Chinese hackers targeting us and so on and so forth. So as we recover from this pandemic, we will have to start making certain serious changes to our diplomatic strategy. And that diplomatic strategy will start coming to us with a cyber warfare cost as well.
Milan, thank you. I mean, that, those, those are very interesting uh, views uh, in terms of as we recover from the pandemic, how should we be looking at our diplomacy? How should we be looking, building our relationships? And I think time will only tell how we evolve. Yeah. I mean, if I could just add, if I could just add one more thing, I think sure. uh, ultimately we also need to realize that people will do what facilitates convenience for them. Sometimes we might we might do what's convenient for us. Even I mean, I mean, uh, th th this th this uh, uh, seminar itself. I mean, given all the controversy about Zoom and organizations like the UNDP even telling their employees to not use Zoom and all that, the fact that we are having a cyber security discussion on Zoom. I think itself highlights how uh, most of the time, even those of us who maybe should know better or should be more cautious, we do sort of uh, uh, adapt to things based on our convenience. And that is more of what we will be seeing in the future. Absolutely, Nilan. I, I think this, this discussion has been on ever since uh, Zoom has hit the headlines, right? I mean, Zoom from five to 10 million users, within weeks, they hit large numbers, right? Overnight, they became so popular, the most needed platform to stay connected, right? So, so that actually made them the most vulnerable platform as well. Let's talk about Microsoft. Microsoft is also widely used. Android, widely used. So as the number of users increase, the threat surface also will increase. I mean, that's the reality, and that's the way the world is, right? But as we, you and I start using technology, and I think what we need to be conscious is, where do we trade off? What is the cost? What is the cost of convenience, right? So with those thoughts, I'm just going to move on to Rahal. Rahal, you and I have been in this industry for nearly 20 years, and we've talk, spoken about a lot of things with respect to cyber. I just want to take back uh, to a particular data statistics, which was published by Checkpoint. A checkpoint uh, researchers said that there were about 16,000 plus websites which were registered with the name COVID. Right? And when the analyst, what the analyst found out that about 2,000 plus websites were primarily instrumental in propagating malware, malicious content. Now, in a situation like this, this situation has never happened, right? And I don't think we would live to see another situation. And I hope and pray that it will never happen in our lifetime, right? But the situation has forced people to seek information. I would like your thoughts on how, how has this affected people psychologically, emotionally? You know, your thoughts on that, uh, Ra? Thanks, Sujit. Uh... And uh, I, I agree with uh, Milan as well. Uh, I think he captured uh, uh, the political aspect of cybersecurity uh, in great detail. So um, let me uh, continue from there and uh, try and uh, answer your question as well, Sujit. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, kind of uh, uh, have a simplistic look at this, and uh, I have this accusation of oversimplifying security as well. Uh, but uh, let me do this. Uh, so uh, basically, we need to understand why someone should attack us. What is the motive behind it? Uh, I think understanding that gives us a great deal of insight and uh, helps us to uh, develop that kind of common sense and awareness around that. And also it helps us to uh, create that foresight, which will help us in many ways uh, to overcome this challenge. So um, there are multiple factors uh, uh, that we need to consider. Uh, political is one, definitely. Uh, Milan touched upon it, uh, so I'm not going to uh, elaborate on that. Uh, then we have psychological factors. I think right now, what is affecting us the most are psychological factors. So this pandemic, any pandemic creates panic. So we are in a, a kind of state of panic right now. And we have this great insecurity around us. 
which basically clouds our judgment and analysis as well to a great deal. So this is this is a very vulnerable time for general public, the corporates, the governments, uh, for all of us, uh, because of this, you know, the panic and sense of insecurity, which basically uh, weakens us uh, in terms of our analysis, our awareness, and everything. Then also, what we need to look at is uh, the economic factors. If you look at this pandemic, um, the ILO is estimating uh, almost 200 million uh, job losses in, in this quarter itself. 200 million job losses. That's like six to seven percent of the total workforce. Uh, and what are they going to do? They are going to lose their income. Uh, I mean, what are the other avenues of earning income? And what more is, you know, apart from the job losses, we are seeing a reduction, what we call the employment contraction, uh, reduction of the number of hours that we work, uh, and a reduction of the overall income uh, which attached to it. So in a situation like this, what would people resort to do? So that is something that we need to look at as well. And to add to this, people are stuck in homes. You know, almost four, uh, uh, you know five fourths of the workforce right now are in the lockdown state in the world. So they are stuck at home. And if you can't go out, where would you go? So these are some of the factors. Then the social factors, as I said, you know, we all are forced to work from home. Um, and we are basically um, uh, kind of in a uh, this mad rush to uh, you know collect items, uh, the essential items, and things like that. And in that panic, we tend to do a lot of things which we would not do usually. So these are these are some of the you know, kind of factors which makes us more vulnerable in a time of crisis like this. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I don't think uh, the bad guys are going to spare anyone, irrespective of the, uh, the, 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 the irony that we are facing right now. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so these are some of the things uh, so did that we need to take into consideration. Uh, I think we will be in a better position uh, if you try to understand the motives, why should somebody uh, attack us? Um, if you understand the vulnerabilities, um, as, as I think uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a common, uh, you know, kind of a uh, norm that we say um, security is as strong as the weakest link. Right. So, and we all know the weakest link is the human factor. Right. So this is where I say uh, this is even more grave, the situation, because people are even more vulnerable right now. And uh, but what is the answer? So are we, I mean, we are forced to work from home. So what are the things that we need to do? I mean, how do we I mean, go around this? Uh, so I think uh, understand the motives, uh, uh, having a kind of a deep understanding on that. Why should somebody attack me? Uh, what do I have? Uh, why? Uh, I mean, what is the motive behind it? Is it a commercial motive? Is it a political motive? Um, uh, is it a social motive? Uh, so there are a lot of motives. And if you look at the vulnerabilities um, that we are basically uh, kind of this particular uh, situation creates, so we have the human vulnerabilities. I think that is uh, uh, grave as ever in this situation. Uh, we have process vulnerabilities because we are working from home, and you know these corporate uh, best practices and you know the security guidelines and all that. I think we need to bring home now. Uh, so we need to create a uh, kind of a whole new framework for us to uh, 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 kind of uh, operate as usual. And then the technological vulnerabilities, because we don't have, as everybody knows, uh, we don't have the corporate level protection right now. 
So how do we protect ourselves in a situation like that? So uh, with, with this pandemic, I think uh, uh, these broad vulnerabilities that we uh, looked at very carefully and in detail, and we need to basically uh, kind of, uh, I think a lot of corporates have come up with frameworks to uh, you know, uh, overcome these challenges. Uh, and then the threat side, I think uh, uh, that is also very important. I think in Sri Lankan context, if you look at uh, the threat landscape, I think uh, Lal gave a very, very broad uh, uh, kind of overview as to what we are fighting against. But right now, what we see is um, um, because of the, uh, the, the the situations created by this pandemic, you know, the economical challenges and all that, I think ransomware is something that we need to defend against. Um, I mean, we need to strategize and defend against. Uh, so ransomware is going to grow exponentially in my way. Uh, and in uh, Sri Lanka uh, is very susceptible to ransomware as well at individual level and at corporate level. Uh, uh, so I think we have seen uh, uh, a rise in uh, ransomware attacks uh, uh, last year and this year as well uh, in the corporate environment. Uh, then scamming. So people uh, not only exploit our human vulnerabilities. So if you look at, uh, uh, you know, all human vulnerabilities, the root of the vulnerability is greed and fear. So this is what, uh, you know, social engineering exploits. That's our greed and fear. So uh, not only that, during this type of crisis, people exploit our goodness as well, you know, our compassion. For example, I have seen quite a number of uh, scams around, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, helping people, charities, uh, quite, a, quite a number of uh, scams around that. So we need to advise uh, uh, the general public how to not, uh, you know, fall prey for those things. Uh, and credit card fraud, I think uh, this, is, this is a big, big, uh, Worry, I think Sunari also can uh, uh, add to this. Uh, so we have situations, uh, you know, um, even I got calls like this, you know, and I'm, I'm very, um, I'm not, not really nice to them when, when they talk like that. Uh, uh, you know, I get these calls from personal numbers, uh, you know, uh, and they say they are from this, this bank and they're giving a special offer a kind of a moratorium on uh, you know loans and you know uh, and special concessions around that and can I basically verify your uh, credentials? Uh, then I asked one person, okay, uh, how did you get my number? Then he said, uh, I got it from our, our database. Uh, you are one of our customers, and I got your number from our client database. And then I asked, okay. You got my number from your client database. So you are calling from a personal line, and you expect me to give, you know, very personal details, like which can be used on uh, card not present transactions over the internet. Uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, can I verify you that you are the bank? Uh, you know, uh, can you tell me what is the last transaction? Where did I do the last transaction? Uh, so this has become a big problem. I think uh, people fall prey for this because uh, you know you know a lot of people. I, um, most of the time, it's uh, um, these calls are coming from uh, the legitimate banks, but the risk there is uh, someone else can also impersonate a bank and uh, get these details. So I think these type of things uh, are very prevalent in Sri Lanka, uh, Sujit. Right now, I think uh, general public. I think Lal can help. Uh, you know probably uh, kind of uh, formulating a uh, kind of a policy uh, around this uh, to you know how to handle a call center, uh, especially in the banking sector. I think this is a dire need uh, right now. Thank you, Lal. I mean, thank you, Rahal. Uh, I, I, you had interesting uh, views. And, and whoever called you probably was trying to test your cybersecurity skills, <laughs> your awareness levels, right? So with that thought, I would like to take the same question back to Sunari. 
right? I, I mean, you, I, I know you may not be able to talk from your organization perspective, but generally from a financial organization's perspective, what should an organization be doing to protect the customers? Because today, as Rahul mentioned, all of us are homebound for the last 40, 45 days. You've got to transact, you've got to carry on with your day-to-day -day life, you've got to put the food on the table, you know, you've got to pay your bills. How do you ensure, or how can you help our listeners so that they can actually stay safe? Oh, geez. Um, Sonari, before you take off, uh, just we seem to be having a little bit of a problem with your camera. It's zooming in and out. So maybe if you could just switch the camera off, we still uh, will uh, hear you on the audio and take it from there. Hi, Murai. Is that okay now? That's fine. Yes, thank you. So, hi, Sujit. Uh, hi, Murai. Uh, and hi to everyone else in the panel. Uh, and everyone else joining the webinar. Great to be on the panel with you guys. Uh, so, yeah, Sujit, to answer the, your question about challenges in servicing customers uh, while ensuring security under these circumstances, I think, uh, as with all other changes brought on by the pandemic, servicing customers has gone through a drastic and unprecedented change. And in terms of the associated cyber vulnerability and the risk, I think uh, this has become very challenging, particularly in the financial services sector where there are a lot of uh, payments involved and where suddenly everyone wants to do online payments. And I would say that uh, the COVID-19 has kind of become a digital banking reality check for the financial institutions, regulators, and governments across many markets, and including Sri Lanka. Because uh, I think despite all of the talk for the past several years about becoming digital banking ecosystem, I think many of us have come to the realization that basic digital banking deliverables are falling far short from expectations at a time the consumers have few options. Because, uh, for example, from opening of an account to onboarding customers to a digital platform, uh, to the application of a loan or authorizing identities, the system is inadequate to support this without the support of the branches. Uh, because now, on the other hand, the social distancing and lockdown situation have seen many customers wanting to suddenly get on to the digital platforms, many of whom were rather reluctant previously to get on to these uh, platforms. Now, uh, on the other hand, the regulator as well, as they rightly should, have been pushing the banks to accommodate more and more uh, digital transactions and digital onboarding in supporting uh, the customers who are accessing the system from home and who cannot visit the branch. So I think uh, in terms of the challenges and the security, we can look at it in three angles, the operational aspect, the compliance, and the government. So uh, in terms of uh, supporting online customers, I think uh, the very first challenge that the financial institutions across many jurisdictions, including Sri Lanka, came across under this situation is that uh, our existing KYC and AML policies typically require face-to-face -face identity verification for customer onboarding, even for the digital platforms, even when you are an existing customer. And this has become problematic suddenly. And in, in a bit of support to this situation, the regulator in Sri Lanka, as well as uh, in many Asian markets, I think, has temporarily relaxed the KYC requirements and have allowed the EP, uh, E or the digital KYC, which is a good thing at this point in time. But then the challenge does not end there. Now, the challenge for the financial institutions is fine. You can now go for digital KYC, but how do you accommodate this? Suddenly and rapidly, you have to come up with systems which will support uh, this digital onboarding of customers uh, as well as a digital KYC. You have to suddenly come up with these applications. When you are going to do that, the next uh, issue, of course, is that uh, you're working with skeleton staff and sometimes you're depending on third party vendors to do this system. So how do you ensure the security? Because uh, 
now you are bringing in systems for customers to access which will be uh, internet facing applications so while you may be doing with minimum staff or doing it in shorter time scale you need to make sure that all the security checks and balances are still in place and uh, once that uh, interfacing part is done i think the other challenge would be how do you uh, manage the governance and the back office part now you have uh, to convert all back office operations to support this new digital relationships that too with skeleton staff uh, and some of uh, remote working staff so the security challenge of introducing this new system means you have to adjust your back end processes you have to improve your detection uh, fraud detection mechanisms and also ensure that the governance is still in place because uh, just because you are working with skeleton staff you cannot let go of your segregation of duties the usual uh, audit checks you have to still make sure all of those are still in place and of course the other challenge as unfortunately even under the circumstances as with any uh, pandemic or any global crisis the phishing scams have really gone up and in terms of digital platforms suddenly uh, you are uh, giving new systems to your customers some of whom are totally new to your digital platforms who have absolutely no familiarity of even the look or feel of your applications so which is like absolute wonderful playground for the threat actors who can make use of this situation uh, to come up with phishing scams so i think uh, banks uh, have to continuously uh, provide awareness to customers to that extent i think lal and his team has been uh, very helpful with the finci sir always keeping the financial institutions uh, informed about uh, the phishing scams the malicious mails what not so the financial institutions on the other hand need to come up with innovative ways to keep uh, the customers continuously informed about this phishing scam because as i said this is a whole new lot of customers who have probably not used the online platforms previously uh, so and i think again uh, in terms of uh, the awareness schemes you need to kind of mix and balance it with uh, many more and you need to be creative uh, maybe you can use uh, email sms uh, or maybe the official social media pages because i think we should not come to the situation uh, where uh, customers will just uh, come to a point where they will just ignore the advisory notices from banks saying oh, okay just another advisory so i think uh, the institutions who are providing these financial services also need to uh, be proactive uh, in terms of the awareness provided but of course the other hand uh, the institutions alone cannot do this it is like a 50 50 thing and the end user themselves have to be educated uh, i think again uh, uh, the the sl search and at the national level there is a lot we can do in terms of uh, the citizenship awareness uh, because uh, as we all know uh, the typical end user is not worried about uh, whether all the uh, latest security patches or the virus guard is running in their machine uh, and as uh, milan mentioned earlier i mean they just want to get on with what they want to do they still want to make the payment or they still want to go online and buy stuff and uh, they will think very little about the security levels of their machines or whether they are wi- home wifi password is secure so i think we need to continuously to keep the uh, citizen aware of the challenges that come across along with these type of uh, digital onboarding uh but of course uh, as uh, sujit said at the beginning it's not doomsday not i think not all change is bad this demand for remote services and e-commerce i think has provided a window of opportunity for banks and fintech firms providing or willing to offer solutions in this area so and other thing uh, in sri lanka i think uh, there are still a vast majority of customers who are uh, a bit reluctant to come on to digital platforms so that now that they have come to these platforms i think uh, uh, as financial institutions um, or the payment providers we all need to make sure to somehow retain these customers in these digital platforms 
uh, to two things. A, uh, the, for the personal safety factor, because uh, I don't think this uh, the pandemic and the safety matter will go away anytime soon. And also in post COVID era, all organizations will have to be mindful of their costs. So uh, digital platforms would be a cost effective way for the companies to offer the services. And of course, for the tech savvy customers who have now seen the flexibility offered by this uh, digital onboarding, digital uh, identification, I would say now that the genie is out of the bottle, we will need to continue providing this. But of course, uh, uh, with uh, at the national uh, strategic level, as Lal mentioned, uh, banks do need uh, the Data Protection Act to come in. And similarly, I think uh, now that we have temporarily enabled the digital KYC, uh, the legal framework has to come so that uh, we can continue with uh, this digital onboarding and e-customer onboarding. So as I said, I think uh, this is uh, a good opportunity for the financial institutions and fintech firms in Sri Lanka. And with the right framework, we can all go ahead to provide a truly digital experience to customers. Um, thank you, Sonali. Let me just jump in there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say, uh, first off, thank you that uh, you kind of ended that on a very positive note. Uh, one question that had that we received earlier on, which I'd like to pose, uh, Sujit, specifically to you, and also if the others would like to jump in on that. Yes. Uh, this is from a very lay perspective. Um, and the question is, um, you know how, uh, see, at the moment with being forced, so as much as there are the techies and those that understand technology and those that understand uh, security to a higher level as well as to some level and there's some understanding of it. There's also those of us who don't have a clear understanding of it. We just know that there is a risk, uh, but we don't understand what to do about it. We don't understand uh, what may, really can be done about it. Uh, we just know that we have team leaders and uh, you know senior leadership uh, monitoring, uh, monitoring our tasks, monitoring work from home and we need to perform, we need to make sure that our work is still done. So we go out there and we will just uh, use the most convenient platform available. We will use the most, uh, you know, uh, user friendly uh, platform available to get on with our work. So one of the questions that arose from this uh, sort of situation is that when you're in a situation like this, you have you're using both your personal devices and you're using what is known as I think managed devices, which are devices that are given to you by your organization or by your office. Uh, when you're using a, an unmanaged device or your personal device, which you sometimes have to. So if you uh, take, if we just take a step back and take one more practical kind of look at this, uh, most households that do have computers, because as as uh, both Lal and Nila mentioned, the, uh, the, the percentage of those who are actually on digital platforms is anyway low in Sri Lanka. Yes. But those households that do have uh, access to um, uh, you know the digital resource to the online world who have have a laptop or a PC in their homes the likelihood is that it's one laptop or one PC at most you may have two because you have you know two persons working um, and and they have you know the resource from their workplace as well but you're managing both your personal workspace in your work your 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 work work from home load uh, possibly your spouses or um, an older child who's in the same home, as well as you may have one at minimum or maybe two or more uh, children who are online schooling as well. So you're kind of, you've got this one device that's possibly your personal device, that's possibly an office uh, or a managed device, but still you're using it for multiple roles. You're kind of, you know, uh, this, is, this is from a very, very lay perspective that I'm asking this question. Uh, what sort of a risk factor are we opening ourselves up to? And I'm not speaking just from the perspective of um, credit card fraud or my personal information or, um, you know, possibly some sort of, um, you know, a, a nut job out there trying to get into my personal photographs or something like that. I'm talking from a more, even more, you know, even more significantly from the perspective of the fact that this computer has access to uh, cloud storage of my organization's data and possibly even, uh, you know, access to further data. So, for instance, if you take uh, the American Chamber, uh, we have, uh, you know, we have data on our, on our, on our uh, servers, which uh, includes data from our member organizations, which is 
350 of Sri Lanka's top organizations. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not using um, my uh, work computer here. This is a personal <laughs> device. <laughs> uh, so any of our members out there who are watching, you're completely safe. Don't worry about this. But I'm actually asking as a genuine, you know, genuine question. I happen to have two laptops, so I can I can switch between them. Uh, but what is the risk that's being open out, opened out to those who don't have a choice? As we said, convenience and user uh, friendliness. So what is the risk factor there? And what do you advise in terms of digital hygiene for those of us who, uh, you know, from a lay perspective, who have no choice but to just use uh, the resources available? Yeah. Right. I mean, I think uh, we can we can talk about this for a long time, right? So I, I just want to answer in two parts. And before I actually answer the question, in fact, Lal had done a beautiful, very detailed, uh, you know, a policy. Right? Maybe while I'm talking, you can flash it, Lal. Maybe you can interrupt and you know explain that. If sure, you can, can take a, a, a minute or two. And uh, which then, which yeah. slide number is this, gentlemen? Let me try and no, get it up. It's a PDF. Right, it's a PDF. All right, okay. Said. Yeah, just bring sure. it up. Let me so, share that. Lal, if you can take a minute or two, sure. and then yeah. I can come back and answer, because I think uh, the message yeah. which I would like to go out here to our listeners is that the Sri Lanka Search, the national body, has worked on work from home security considerations. So, so there is a very well laid down uh, do's and don'ts. Lalo. So, yeah, basically this, this document, it's on our website. You can download it and give it to your staff. You can share it. Um, uh, this, this website, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, PDF document basically tells you about basic hygiene at home. How, why, how and why you should be protecting your basic hygiene. Uh, it's originally meant for government employees. Uh, it, was, it was sent out to all government uh, uh, employees at the very beginning in, in uh, when when the, when the curfew was imposed and people were asked to work from home. Uh, so we did it for government and it's all went out to all the government agencies in all three languages. Um, but what we've done is we've summarized it and provided that for the general public. So on the left hand side, you're talking about the uh, home best practices for end users. So we're taking, talking about strong passwords, never use personal email for official communications uh never uh never leave your device unattended and so on and so forth very simple things but you know you take it for granted uh it, it's it's you know people do it but actually actually not you know you keep your device unattended most of the time even on your desk uh, at home and walk away and your your little child come in and mess around with it and you might have a have an issue and also the vpn when you access your um uh your service from home um a private network because that's important too and, and secure your wi-fi if you're using wi-fi make sure that you have a very strong password and change your password wi-fi password at home every 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 few weeks uh, particularly in these days when, you, when you're actually using your neighbor could be could be plugging into your, your wi-fi network um, similarly on the right hand side uh, you have the best practices for system administrators um, rahal maybe you can you would know how to explain all that but uh, Primarily is basic stuff. Uh, periodically review your dashboards. Uh, there are alerts generated by internal networks and appliances to trace abnormal activities. Make sure that you, uh, you are the unusual use behavior, behavior is uh, an unwanted, suspicious traffic is monitored and, and taken, taken care of. Uh, arrange uh, and recommend VPN connections for all your users who work from home. Uh, get the, the system administrators uh, should also maintain a list of VPN accounts that, uh, that are used. Uh, uh, I lost it a bit. Uh, yeah, VPN accounts that are used and uh, with access to privileges granted. The list needs to be pre periodically reviewed as well. Uh, and ensure also that VPN accounts that have no longer in use are disabled. There are a lot of people who would use it today and you have not used it for a month. Uh, you should not keep it Keep it, keep it there. You should take it off and get the guy, get the person to log in afterwards. Uh, configure a device to block network access after certain periods of inactivity. Um, so forth. But these are for techies. But I think basic cyber hygiene is on the left-hand column there. I think it's very useful to share that with uh, with users uh, if if you have. 
than our website. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Lal. Actually, what we'll do is we'll share this document uh, with all of the uh, all of the participants today. And one of the questions that Gayan has asked is: Is there any way to connect directly with Sri Lanka CERT and get an update, uh, get the updates that they publish as an organization? Uh, Gayan, yes. the contact details are here at the bottom uh, on this little gray screen, that gray box that you have here. Um, and I think it's uh, pretty simple. You just uh, Google uh, Sri Lanka CERT and you can get directly onto their website. Uh, I oh, did it's, see it's, that it's, there are some direct email addresses as well. So yeah, Lal, can I uh, pass that over to you then? Yeah, just send an email to cert.gov.lk and we will, we, will, uh, we will have all the alerts, email alerts sent to you. But you can, we have a Facebook page um, that actually publishes alerts. Uh, we, we, we continuously uh, have alerts uh, using, uh, using the general, uh, um, general uh, electronic media as well. Yesterday we had one uh, about, about scamming and everything else. Uh, we had one about banks. Um, uh, a few few days ago as well. So the, the amount of scams, uh, as somebody pointed out, uh, uh, as particularly Sunari pointed out, uh, having are on the increase and because there are lots of new users. So yes, uh, we, we, have, we are quite happy to share that with you. Right. Just to answer the second part, if, if you have, if you're compelled to share the device at all, right? Simple things, right? Be, as a, if you look at Lars' document or the policy which they have developed, it clearly says you run basic things like a good antivirus. Right? So anything which comes free may not give you all what you desire, but it gives you the basic one or two things. But try and invest a little more on a good antivirus and ensure your systems are all patched, right, up to date. That's very, very important. And we, we all, I mean, Lal spoke about it, Rahul spoke about it, Milan spoke about it, Sunari spoke about it. It is about individual safety, right? The weakest link in the chain. So I'm going to talk from a Sri Lanka's perspective as citizens of Sri Lanka, residents of this country, or resident of any country, right? We all make up of the national security. Each and every one of us have to do what is right and we need to ensure that we do the right thing. Now, if you look at the large document, it says never visit unwanted websites, right? It's, it's a very broad one, but it clearly conveys a message, right? If, you, if you're going to be using your machine for office work, and if your family is going to be using it, you probably will have to come up with basic guidelines, right? I know it's very challenging because I have two teenagers and uh, maybe we are fortunate we could probably give them uh, two different uh, you know, devices for them. Now, one is interested in hacking and the other one is interested in music and the kind of sites they visit, sometimes we don't even know what, what is actually you know, going there. And then if you take my wife and it's probably, you know, she's more into research, right? And if you, so, so as, as more members try to use the equipment, there, there's more needs and more, more vulnerabilities which get introduced. So always pay attention to good practices, right? I mean, I can talk on this for a long time, but I, in a sense of time, I just want to keep it brief. I mean, uh, Virai, I think we have this question, so let's do a small write-up in terms of the do's and don'ts for the people at home, and we'll share it. Right? So I that think that would be absolutely yeah. wonderful, yeah. yeah. If we can do that, it would be brilliant, and we can share that Correct. across let's, as well. Let's do that. So, and uh, how much uh, time do we have, right? Because I have... Uh, we have uh, about eight or eight to 10 minutes left. Okay. Uh, so, so let me just throw one of the other questions uh, into the panel. Sure. Um, one of the questions from Dulmi is, what is your advice on having your camera covered with an increase in fraud? Can people spy on your home and compromise your safety? What is the extent of such cases reported in Sri Lanka? Again, like I said, there's a lot of lay questions coming in here, which I think are important. I actually do... Um, I, I, one of my team members had uh, over the last, this is nothing to do with COVID, uh, the camera, the light on her camera had been coming on in office and she actually had a piece of uh, post-it taped over her camera because that's how much it freaked her out. And that I, is the reality. I mean, you know, I a lot can of us show you this. Up. If you can yeah. see here, it is so, covered. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I think very good question, Durmi. Thank you for that. Uh, panel, over to you for your response on that. Rahat. You keep smiling, so I will pass this on to you. No, I think I think that is a real threat. I think there have been instances. Uh, it's 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 not a very difficult thing to do as well for a 
for a person who wants who are really interested in hacking you uh, who really wants to get through to you you know and spy on you that's that's quite that's a possibility i think uh, if you have a concern like that i think you physically cover it i think that's the best uh, guideline uh, we can give just to add uh, uh, to something uh, both lal and uh, sujit covered uh, you know this uh, how do we basically uh, uh, use a single device for corporate and uh, you know personal use i think that is the case with lot of people the majority of the people so uh, uh, one one um, simple suggestion i can do is now during this time you know you start at home so we go everywhere in the internet and good places and bad places both uh, so um, these bad places carry a lot of a uh, lot of malware uh, you know uh, and uh, you have to be uh, very careful with that and then again we go and do our shopping online uh, that's the second part of that you know use your credit card and all that and do that thirdly we connect to our corporate uh, networks through the same computer so if you must uh, you know do all these things i would uh, advise i this is not a full proof you can say but this acts as another layer of security if you want to do shopping use a separate browser if you want to connect to a corporate to a browser have a dedicated browser for that and if you want to if you must go to go to those bad places on the internet use a completely different browser for that so this way you can kind of segregate to a certain extent as well okay rahul just to add one more to it right i mean just to say and sometimes a good site also can turn turn bad when i say a good site can turn bad because it's like a watering hole let's say there's a news website so the bad guys know that's a place everybody actually will go to get information so they would probably infect that particular site so it is very very important that you have a good antivirus installed on your device both on your mobile and on your laptops as well right so in addition to that right i mean just to answer your question we write directly today when you install an application the application asks certain permissions access to the camera access to the microphone so certain things you can physically go and disable it having done that it doesn't mean it gives you full proof protection at least you have taken that step and the last thing you would look at is covering the camera yeah. uh, virai do you have any other questions um yeah so it so okay we have another question from kanishka abekol kanishka ask mr lal dash showed us a statistical presentation of the computer literacy in people in sri lanka my question is just because people have no computer literacy that doesn't mean that their cyber security awareness will be very low how do we ensure that people have cyber security awareness i think basically what the idea behind this is that even though you may not have the access uh, you know and and, and the use of uh, a computer easily uh, that doesn't mean that you uh, you know um, that you should not uh, understand the risks posed I, um, i suppose currently because of curfew maybe there's a limitation on how you can get to a, a communication center or wherever it is uh, but that doesn't mean i'm sure that it doesn't happen so um uh, lal i have to say that i was um, extremely impressed uh, with your presentation and what it showed in terms of how much the state is actually doing uh, that maybe we are not really aware aware of um, i'd like uh, in fact a few a few people had asked the question as well whether we could share the presentation with them uh, with your permission i would like to do that i would like to share it with the participants as well as with sure. uh, the amcham members uh, because i believe it's important for us to understand Uh, as organizations and individuals both how much there is being done from a state uh, from a state perspective in terms of protecting us uh, in this uh, in you know in, in, in this particular um, aspect of things uh, so if i can just pass that on to you but there was also uh, about uh, just to answer that question on. just to oh, answer yeah. that question uh, roy um we are, we are quite aware of the quite uh, aware of the fact that the general public has to be educated and uh, it's something that i mentioned in my presentation as well we we are working on a on a on a on a website called get safe online uh, which uh, which will come up very soon um, and that and that will carry a lot of information a lot of education material people who are not uh, service security savvy uh, for the general public in in mainly 
And, and also, Lal, I just want to uh, uh, emphasize, like the Sri Lanka CERT has had taken the initiative to, you know, take cybersecurity education to the rural areas, including the schools at the primary level. And some of these content have been delivered in the local languages. So, so there's a lot Sri Lanka CERT has done in terms of educating the community. And, and there's a lot which we are doing as professional bodies as well, along with Sri Lanka CERT. Yeah, we use, uh, we work, there's a lot of public-private partnerships uh, going on, right? Uh, we, we work, the, we use the private sector. Sunari, for example, she participates uh, every year as an IAC squared member uh, uh, in the judging panels, uh, the cybersecurity quiz for the school children. Uh, and she's been, been a great help, and so has many others, uh, Parakum, Patrina, and, and a lot of others, a lot of others, including Satsujit. And also, we have a, a massive training program going on for uh, for school teachers on cybersecurity. So, because we can't access every child in school, uh, we we actually have a, a rolling uh, uh, residential program that happens uh, in Colombo. We, we we bring in uh, regional uh, teachers from every region to teach them uh, the basics of cybersecurity. So, when they go back, uh, it's mainly for the IT teachers in schools. So when they go back, they can teach the children on how to be safe online. And we work with the school IT. Uh, every school has, uh, most schools have uh, an IT club, and we work with them very closely. And they are the first point of contact when a child has a, has a cybersecurity incident. It's mostly social media related ones, but it's still at least the IT clubs are their first line of contact. So yeah, there's a lot to be done. You're doing a lot, but there's still a lot to be done. I think Milan was trying to say something. Yeah, yeah I, just want to, I just want to add one thing. So uh, we've got to remember that there's only so much education that the experts can do. But basic common sense has to be something, uh, has to be something quite uh, organic. So for example, uh, I can go through 10 hours of some big expose on how Facebook uh, sells my private data. But at the end of the day, if I go out there to create a Facebook account, I just scroll down to the, uh, to, to the end there. I click on, I agree to your terms and conditions and I get on with uh, creating a Facebook account. So uh, ultimately there's only so much education that can be given. I mean, uh, uh, what Rahal said earlier about the scammers who call him, right? So uh, he now, uh, regardless of how educated he is, he has, has the presence of mind to deal with that. And if you don't have the presence of mind to deal with it, then you could be an encyclopedia on cyber crimes and uh, ultimately it wouldn't really have the social sort of impact that we would like it to have. So uh, at some point of time, uh, the, the, uh, the point where the experts can help you will stop and you will have to, you, I mean, as the general public will have to start kind of, you know, applying basic common sense uh, uh, to, to these decisions as well, which I think goes back to Sonari's point earlier of how, uh, 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 about how as we become more digital, will customers really care about the advisories we give them? Will customers really listen to the technical advice that we uh, that we sort of give them? And this, this was my point earlier when I made a comparison between South Korea and Sri Lanka. A, a, a digital country doesn't necessarily mean a digitally savvy population unless that digital country became digital organically. If it's just become digital overnight in order to cope with the crisis, that still doesn't mean that the, that the population at heart is digitally savvy. And no matter how much we bombard them with the advice and advisories and we need to do this, we need to do that, ultimately it will come down to the common sense uh, process that goes on in that person's uh, mind when that person uh, takes a decision. Thank you, Nilan, for those thoughts. Uh, right, again, the same question. How yeah, are we doing sorry. our time? So, uh, yeah, we're, we're actually out of time, but I do want to pose one more question to the panel because it came in quite early and it's coming from three different uh, parties as well. Uh, so one of the things that uh, Lal mentioned was about the national uh, digital signature, uh, the digital signature. So three, uh, we have got three questions actually asking for a little bit more insight on the national, on the digital signature. And also if there is a possibility of getting it for corporates and how this can be done. Uh, I'm going to club in with that one more question that we have there, which is any idea when the Data Protection Act would actually be enacted. So I'm just going to pose those few questions uh, and then uh, Sujit, you take it from there and then we'll uh, 
end. We might be running uh, maybe about 10 minutes uh, over time. Okay, give, we do give have me, uh, quite a few uh, quite a few of our panelists still online waiting to answer those, hear those answers. So let's go ahead. Okay, give me, give me two minutes. I'll answer those two questions. One, uh, regarding digital signatures, the National Certification Authority uh, was established, uh, as, as I said, was, was actually launched uh, in early, early March this year. So, and there, is, there are certificate service providers. Now, Lanka Clear or Lanka Sign is one of the certificate service providers. So they issue a certificate, uh, a digital certificate, which you can use for digital signing. Um, but we are in the process of, of uh, authorizing other certificate service providers for this purpose. But um, if the users want more details about how to incorporate that into their corporate networks, uh, I would suggest send us an email to that same address uh, or lal at cert.gov.lk and we can take them uh, through. For example, the, the CEB has adopted it and they have procedures in place and we are quite happy to share the, those procedures, uh, the processes and procedures with uh, any corporate that wants help uh, with that. Um, Electricity board, a government agency, has incorporated uh, in, in in big big time, and they're, they're going ahead with it. Um, second question on data protection act. Uh, unfortunately, um, although the, the 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 bill has been passed by the uh, by have been approved by the by the cabinet of ministers, it has still got to go to parliament to get uh, yeah, get acted. So that until that happens, uh, people like Sari for their KYC. <laughs> We'll have to wait. I'm sure that all the banks are waiting for that. And, and it has the privacy uh, part as well, just not just not just data protection. Uh, thank you for that, Lars. So, Jit, let me uh, hand over back to you to uh, for any uh, closing remarks that uh, you or, in fact, any of the other panel members would like to share. Any closing remarks that you'd like to, closing thoughts that you'd like to share with the... Yeah. Uh, the uh, Sh shall we do it this way, all right? Let's take a 30 seconds closing remark from all the panelists and then I'll summarize and we'll wrap it up, right? There you uh, go. So um, We'll go with Sunari first, right? Because she is, she is uh, hidden right now. So, the second scenario. <laughs> yes, we had a few questions, in fact, asking where Sunari is hiding. Yes. So I had to take the <laughs> <laughs> malfunction. People were really concerned about her. Yes, exactly. Sunari, <laughs> <laughs> so over to you. 30 seconds. So, uh, Post-COVID, uh, technical difficulties prevented uh, the video part. Anyhow, uh, so I think uh, uh, I would like to kind of continue from what uh, Nilan mentioned. Because uh, from, I think, since we have covered the end user perspective, as far as the corporates are concerned, because uh, with the remote workers uh, largely at work, so I think uh, as far as the vulnerabilities, cyber vulnerabilities for the organizations are concerned, I think the vulnerabilities always remain the same. Uh, the same vulnerabilities that uh, prevailed before COVID prevails still the same, except those are amplified by more workers working remotely, which gives a larger attack surface. So I would think that uh, the basic stuff, like uh, the stuff that get you have remains same uh, as the missing patches, the insufficient hardening, unnecessary exposure, insufficient monitoring, and phishing. So I think uh, those, uh, the basic stuff still remains. And I think uh, as corporates, what we need to do is if we stick to the basics, if we uh, go by our standard uh, security management frameworks, uh, if we stick to the basics, I think uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can all uh, come out this uh, situation uh, uh, with uh, much less problems. And uh, also, uh, in terms of remote working, uh, I think we've already mentioned the additional precautions that you need to take on the organization side. Probably it's time to uh, look at some cloud solutions, virtualization, multi-factor, stuff like that. But then uh, what I would like to say, reiterate, is that if we stick to the basics of information security, I think uh, we can all come out uh, with it safely uh, with uh, some continuous education. Thank you. Thank you, Sonari. Nilan. Okay, so I, I just like to sort of echo uh, uh, what Sunari said. I think that, that was spot on. Just use uh, basic common sense. If someone gives you a call asking you for details and their story doesn't add up, then don't trust them. If you're worried about your camera, just use a piece of paper to stick, you know, to, to stick it on to the camera. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, that's what 
do not be that person whom Facebook tells you, we will take your data, you then click on, I agree with your terms and conditions, and then you act all outraged and surprised when a journalist tells you that Facebook is selling your data, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the only advice I can give them. Read what your service provider is telling you, because usually your service provider will be giving you good advice, and just stick to that. Use common sense. That's it. Thank you, Nila. Rahal, your thoughts? I think my mantra, my oversimplified mantra for security had always been uh, threefold. Uh, so, did, so as I think a lot of uh, uh, panelists uh, kind of address this common sense, I think common sense can solve almost 80% of these problems if you have common sense. Um, and also, I think uh, to add to that, um, we need to develop our capacity to analyze and uh, basically uh, kind of uh, anticipate. Uh, so kind of developing that foresight. I think foresight is extremely important in security. Uh, that is a must to have. I, I think that that's nothing technical. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a capability that we build within ourselves. And also, um, as uh, Nilan uh, very rightly said, uh, uh, no knowledge can save us if we don't have the self-awareness. If we don't do, if we don't know what we are doing at present, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this defeats everything that we do, not only security. I think that's that's what I wanted to uh, uh, share with as the final thoughts. Thank you, Rahul. Rahul, closing thoughts. Dan? Okay, yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay. Closing remarks. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think one closing remark, uh, one main closing remark would be, um, I think, corporates, um, large corporates, banks, government departments have not taken cybersecurity seriously in the past. I think COVID-19 has, has actually opened the eyes of a lot of institutions, a lot of organizations. And uh, basic cyber hygiene was never, never observed in I would say 50% of the organizations. Um, but that's something that we're gonna learn from, from COVID-19, and I hope we can keep the pace. Thank you, Lal. Right, I mean, uh, just my thoughts on closing. COVID-19, I, I keep telling this to all my friends and colleagues, should have happened two years ago, or if not four years ago, we would have repurposed everything. We would have thought differently. Right? But nothing is lost. Right? It provided us an opportunity to recreate, and we've been very creative. Organizations overcame challenges. Right? They were able to deliver goods and services, not at the rate which probably they would have done on a normal day, but they're getting there. Adoption of cloud has been accelerated. Right? People who never thought of cloud adoption, they're adopting. People who never thought of adopting digital, they are thinking about it. So a whole lot of opportunities. A variety of opportunities, not only to digitize, but also to provide new services. So there's an opportunity for all of us. What? While there are opportunities for individuals and organizations, the, the, the people, the bad actors, the adversaries out there, are also opportunities. Right? So they would also want to leverage. They would also want to optimize. It could be a rogue nation. It could be a malicious actor who is trying to you know, make a good gain out of it commercially. Then of course, there are the guys who actually give the teams like Lars team or the ICT or the CID uh, who propagate malicious news, false news. Right? Or sometimes they would want to you know, create instability in the political arena or try changing the political system. So, so while these challenges will coexist with opportunities, we as individuals, we as organizations would have to continuously reassess, repurpose, and look at what the opportunities provide and also ask ourselves, how do we actually meet these challenges? Every opportunity 
it's a positive sign. But when you look at it from a security perspective, everybody would say, do, should we do this at a cost? I like Rahal's statement. He always says simplified, oversimplified security. Right? So we need to meet the bare minimum. Look at our houses. Do we have barricades? Do we, have, do we fortify our houses? We look at the basic minimal security so that we, can stay, we all can stay safe. So that's what Lal was echoing, the hygiene. Do we practice the basic hygiene? Now we talk about, today we talk about 20 minutes of, 20 seconds of hand wash, right? So you wash your hands for 20 seconds. How many of you change your passwords? Often, right? I always ask this question, do you change your toothbrush? Then I ask, do you change your passwords? Now every time, now, I, I can't remember who said like to change the password often. Right? I think Lal, you mentioned, right? Change your password, the Wi-Fi password. I'm talking about changing the passwords in every single system, every single application. That's a challenge. And that introduces a vulnerability. So the option you have, reduce the number of applications, reduce the number of devices so that you remember only one. Now, today we don't use one master key to open all the doors or all the locks. We have separate keys for separate doors and separate uh, locks. So I think we need to relook at the way we are going to function from today. Because when we return, when we return to the physical world again, when we walk out of this lock lockdown, we are not going to go into the same place where we left on 15th of March or 16th of March. We are going to go back into a new place, a new beginning. So all what we did in March may not be appropriate for us. So we have to start doing that validation. And the good thing, I want to close in positives, right? I remember reading an article somewhere in December, can the internet break if in case if all the world get onto the digital platform? Internet survived. Maybe they did a lot of uh, tweaking to ensure the traffic flowed, but it survived. And I must give credit to our telecom operators. They ensured continuity. I, I'm yet to hear from somebody who said, you know, I, my links were down. I don't, I didn't hear that. I mean, they gave the best. Positive, right? So, so everyone chipped in and the services were delivered. And, and in closing, let's look at a positive thing. And I think the government also has taken a lot of positive steps. Now we're just waiting for certain legislations to be passed. But if you look at the cyber law or the computer acts, we have one of the best in the region, or if not in the world. Lal, I mean, Jayantha is unfortunately not here, but otherwise that's a fact. And a lot of things, now we talk about the electronic transaction bills, digital signatures, all these things were planned through several years ago, right? So we are at the ideal place to launch, to adopt digitization. And I think we should actually look at it more positively and embrace uh, digital going forward. So with that, I hand the session over back to Virai. Th thanks once again, all the panelists. It was lovely being with you. And also all those view listeners, viewers who joined us from all over the world, right? I know people, some of them joined from far as Canada, Middle East, and then in other parts of the world as well, including Sri Lanka. Over to you, Vera. Thanks again, Sujit. Uh, appreciate everything that you had to share with us and everything you said. Uh, before I go into uh, my closing remarks and what I need to do for closing, uh, let me just play this uh, video clip for you, which is a message actually from a collaborative partner for uh, this session, uh, CyberCorp by uh, Layer 7 Technologies. In today's fast-moving digital environment, how can we truly protect our information? Especially when the cybercriminal network is sophisticated enough to exploit any vulnerability by the click of a button. At CyberCom, we are integrating business understanding with digital innovation and human insight to help solve this important problem. We are using the power of digital disruption to see beyond the threat of a global cybersecurity espionage campaign by working closely with our partners. 
most businesses don't even know when hacks are happening. Experts say the majority of hacks, 75% of them in fact, happen at small or medium-sized companies. You just don't hear about them. It's now becoming clear that this malicious software has run riot around the world. Russia, the United States, and many points in between have been hit by what's now a common form of cybercrime. And it often arrives in the form of a link in an innocuous looking email. When you click on that link, the malicious software is downloaded and spreads rapidly through your network, locking up all the files on it. We have been able to brief the security community to help prevent, detect and respond to these cyber attacks. Together, we are helping to build a robust and secure digital society. As companies pivot towards a digital business model, the amount of data generated and shared among organizations, partners and customers is growing exponentially. This digital information has become the lifeblood of today's interconnected business ecosystem and is increasingly valuable to organizations and to skilled threat actors. Business digitization has also exposed companies to new digital vulnerabilities, making effective cybersecurity and privacy more important than ever. We help clients take a broader view of cybersecurity and privacy as both protectors and enablers of the business. Think before you click. So that was a very timely and important message that I think uh, plays uh, beautifully into everything that we've discussed uh, here this evening. Uh, that's from our collaborative partner for this evening session, uh, CyberCorp by um, Layer 7 Technologies, uh, Layer 7 Inno uh, Innovations rather, I do apologize. Uh, so Sujit, uh, Lal, Rahal, uh, Nilam and uh, Sunari, thank you. Thank you so much for your insights and your analysis and everything that you had to share with us this evening. Uh, I think the key takeaways for us uh, have been the importance of digital hygiene uh, and exactly, uh, although we talk about digital hygiene and we use these words out there, uh, I think today gave us insights and a step-by-step -step breakdown of what that actually means and what that actually uh, entails for us both as uh, laypersons and end users as well as, uh, you know, for the, for the more techies among us. Uh, so thank you for that. I think also very importantly, we understood where the state is and what the state is doing in terms of ensuring cybersecurity and, sci and uh, working against cyber vulnerability, uh, as well as educating and, and uh, you know, um, and communicating to the public, to the general public, um, what the risks involved are and what they need to do in terms of uh, protecting themselves and protecting uh, their communities and uh, the nation uh, as a whole. Uh, so my appreciation to each and every one of you for everything shared uh, this evening. My appreciation to every one of our, um, of our attendees, those, of, uh, those who were watching us live on Facebook as well. Um, as always, this video will be available uh, both on Facebook as well as on our newly launched YouTube channel, uh, channel within the next couple of days. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, take a look at that. Uh, I will be sharing the documents as promised by uh, Lal. We will share the uh, slides, the presentation. Uh, as well as that PDF uh, with uh, digital hygiene breakdown that was there with uh, each of our members as well as with each of our participants uh, this evening. Um, and as uh, Lal also mentioned, the uh, CERT uh, contact details are on that document and we encourage you if you're, in, if you're facing any issues, any do go ahead and send an email in. Uh, they have their, their, their uh, engineers, their, their technical uh, staff uh, on standby, they will get back to you. Uh, do bear in mind, everybody, including them, is working from home, so there may be, uh, you know, a tad of a delay, but uh, they will definitely get back to you uh, because we're all in this together at the end of the day. Uh, as to the questions, there are five questions that we were unable to get through and get to, and uh, that was specifically for the reason that they entail more detailed uh, responses and more detailed information that we have the time to provide on this webinar today. So what we will be doing is I will share those with the panelists and uh, get, I will get their responses and then email it out to you, uh, giving you the answer to your specific question from each of our panelists. Uh, so don't fret, we haven't uh, neglected you, we haven't forgotten you. Uh, we will get to your questions. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about communication, uh, something that actually we discussed this morning as well on a, on a completely different panel and the importance of communication, especially in times of crisis, uh, how it should be effective, how it should be positive, and uh, how necessary it is. 
uh, it ties in beautifully with what we were talking about here today in terms of um, educating the general public, educating the students, and um, both in terms of what they need to do as well as what the, what steps are being taken uh, in order to in order to protect them. So do join us next week. Keep an eye on our bulletin board. We'll send you the details for that one. Uh, hopefully, it will be next Thursday at the same time, same place. Uh, so do keep an eye out for that and join us for that. Uh, once more, uh, thank you to each and every one of you, Sujit, Lal, uh, Rahal, Nilan, and Sunari, uh, and to each and every one of our viewers and all of those who participated by sending us questions uh, and also by participating in our poll. Uh, just in case you haven't already, do, do uh, uh, send in your answers to the poll and do fill in the little survey form that pops up at the end of this session uh, because it will help us uh, to curate the next series of topics that we have for you uh, so that we can better provide you with uh, the support and the uh, resources necessary uh, for us all to navigate through uh, this current crisis. Uh, thank you again. Stay safe on behalf of the AmCham team. Uh, stay safe, stay home, stay healthy. Uh, have a very good evening and uh, have a blessed weekend as well.